Hi and welcome to this session on Siam, what it is, what it's about. Um, I'm going to be talking around the model of Siam, the ecosystem, the roadmap, lots of information around Siam which I hope you'll find useful and helpful in your day-to-day -day role. So first off, what, it, what Siam isn't? So let, let's set some base expectations here. So first of all, and, and I wish it was, but it isn't, it's not the answer to all of your problems with service providers. It, it's not something that you, you take on and all of the day-to-day uh, -day operational, strategic, tactical activities, keeping the lights on with all of your service providers, it's not suddenly going to go away. It's not a magic... Uh, solution that will that, that will solve everything clearly the more you put into it the more you're going to get out of it of course so it's not replacing ITIL it's not replacing DevOps it's that there are similarities but it's it's not it's not a decision where you have to decide okay which route are we going to or are, are we going to follow ITIL or are we going to, to follow Siam it, it's it's not like that um, and it, it's also it's got some history, so it's been around for a while. It's not something that that was that sort of came about um, six months ago. It, it's been around for, uh, for for quite a while. So what is Siam? Well, I'm from a service management background, IT service management background, and have been for the last twenty five years. So uh, in the same way, Siam, um, it's, it's ITSM based, it's service orientated, and it's part of my toolkit. And, and I, I think it's something that should be part of um, everyone who, who's been involved in IT service management should be part of your talk toolkit as well. Typically, organizations that have multi-provider environments, which need attention, um, it, it's something that, that can help there. So what I mean by needing attention is perhaps an organisation is thinking, hey, we need better value, we need better quality. Maybe we're not happy with the quality of our, of our, our current IT landscape and our, our IT operations. Perhaps it's uh, perhaps there's a cost issue there. Perhaps there's a performance and management issue. Perhaps there's some other strategic driver behind this as to as to why Siam is being looked at. Perhaps it's not the right mix of partners. And um, within the journey of Siam there are activities that will start to tease this kind of information out which is really important in order to, to try and understand what is an organisation trying to deliver. It's collaboratively based and absolutely focus on focuses on the end-to-end management and collaboration is a, a key word that comes up quite often in Siam circles uh, collaboration getting all of those service providers working together in a in a, a collective manner particularly useful where an operating model is complex Siam can can bring a great deal of clarity and, and simplicity to um, uh, to the operation, it's a huge amount of work, but um, it certainly can can bring about a great deal of um, or a reduction in complexity. Um, originally came out of the UK government and the public sector in the mid two thousands, and it's used internationally. It has a global reach. There's there's um, certainly uh, big pockets around the globe of, of where the Siam concept, the, the approach has been adopted and, and is being, being worked through. There is a great deal of documentation. There's something called a body of knowledge, BOC. There are process guides. There's also certifications, accreditations, training courses, lots, lots of training available around Siam. And I'd encourage you to um, contact a, a training provider and uh, um, um, become uh, become accredited and, and get certified in, in Siam. It helps deliver end-to-end -end service management. Now, note the word helps in there. I think that's really important. It helps 
deliver end-to-end -end service management doesn't solve it. There, there's, there, you know, there's a there, there's a definite kind of emphasis there in in terms of don't see Siam as completely solving absolutely everything. Um, the more you put into it, the more involved you you, you become within um, a Siam ecosystem. Um, you, you can improve things absolutely one hundred percent. But um, it, it's not it, it's not going to solve every possible sit situation. But um, it's it's certainly something that needs to be part of your your toolkit. Okay, so within Siam there are four different types of models, four different ways of doing Siam, if you like, and those are internal, external, hybrid, and lead supplier and just a bit of information about each model. So the internal model, your customer is actually taking on the role of the service integrator, the SI. Now, the, the critical point here is around the, the customer, that, that, that service integration role needs to be impartial, it must be independent. And I've worked in organisations where um, I've been part of the SIAM team and, and that certainly is, is easier said than done. Um, it's certainly possible, absolutely possible. Um, but um, the impartiality and the independence absolutely needs to be there. That needs to have teeth, if you like, in order to be able to bring internal teams to, a, to account. External model of um, uh, of service integration so the customer appoints an external organization to perform the role of the service in integrator again i've worked in environments where i've i've worked for the customer and the service integrator is an offshore organization or um I, i've certainly worked in environments where um i've i've been working for the service integrator um on behalf of the um the customer important point there is that um, the, uh, the the exclusivity um, being fo focused on service integration now the third model is around a, it is a hybrid model and as you might might imagine it, it's basically a combination of, of the two it's a combination of the internal and, and the external model and then finally, the, the, the fourth model is called lead supplier, where the service integrator is also a service provider. So um, uh, the big question there, that, that there are pros and cons of each type, type of model, but certainly in terms of the lead, lead supplier, it's really important the service, that service provider has the capability to be the service integrator. Uh, the, the, the final point I've put at the bottom there is um, something that will be mentioned a couple of times. It's, it's important to recognise the service integrator does not have a contractual relationship with the service provider. The, the, um, it, that will still go back to the customer. Um, so the role of the service integrator is to provide end-to-end -end integration within that ecosystem. Okay, so there's there's three um, there's three layers to the model. So at the top you have the customer, in the middle you have the service integrator, and then at the bottom you have the, the, the various service providers. Now the service providers can be both internal service providers and they can also be external service providers. So Perhaps have a think about the organisation you work in at the moment and we, um, in terms of how, how do things get sorted, if you like. There's going to be some cases where you'll go, oh yeah, we've got an internal team uh, that will manage and, and fix or address whatever that, that, that issue is. And in the same way, there's going to be other services or other, other systems or whatever it may be that you, you go to an outsource provider, you know, a third party um, in order to provide those the, those services, just a, a quick point as uh, as I talk that through, the the word provider is quite an important terminology. There's there's um, uh, 
there's generally um, other terms that can be used, vendors, suppliers, third parties, so on and so forth. But broadly speaking, the SIAM model likes service provider. So in those three layers, the top layer, the customer organization, so that's that that is well as you might imagine that's your your customer but within that is something called retained capability now um I'll I'll talk in the coming slides a bit more a bit more about that but that that's basically the the capability the customer wants to retain in house the um the the service integrator is is then responsible for service integration within those various service providers and as i've mentioned there can be internal service providers there can be external service providers so the customer so the uh, at the top of the tree if you like you, you you've got your end organization the end client and they are um they are the organization that is moving into this new ecosystem um and it will typically be as a result of some underlying objective, some underlying strategy, that there will be a reason an organization is moving to a SIAM model. And as we come on to the, the various uh, roadmap stages, this is something that's really important to tease out and, and, and understand what is the strategy, what is the organization looking to, to achieve, particularly because that will need to be one of your end results, your, your end management reporting to be able to demonstrate, look, we are achieving what you were strategically try, try, trying to achieve. I, I mentioned a few moments ago about the contractual relationship, so the customer holds those contractual relationships. I've put Racy Matrix there in relation to retained capabilities, but it, it stands for, for all of the, um, the, the various uh, parts of the, uh, of the ecosystem. So Racy Matrix is basically um, who is doing what. So who, who is responsible uh, for a particular activity or service, accountable, which is the A, so it's that accountability factor. They may not necessarily be doing it, but the buck stops with them. Who needs to be consulted? Who who um, should be involved? Are there any subject matter experts? And then who needs to be informed? So just keeping people in into the in the loop. So the reason I draw that out from a retained capability perspective is is more about if or not if a customer is going to retain those um, activities, it's important to to be absolutely clear um, and and documented and avoidance of doubt and all the rest of it in terms of just making sure that it's um, out in the open what are those retained capabilities in my experience in in practice it's generally been governance type activities oversight particularly in regulated environments I, i've seen that predominantly been that is a that is a retained capability um, business engagement, uh, sort of front of house uh, in terms of relationship management, enterprise architecture, arch architecture generally, anything strategic. Now procurement, I've seen that work both ways um, in terms of uh, procurement hasn't been a retained capability and I've also seen it with um, other organisations where retained capability um, ha has been with a, with a service integrator. So you know, I was kind of seeing it on, on both sides and I don't think there's any right or wrong answer that, there. It's just really procurement is certainly one of those items that sometimes a service integrator does it, sometimes they don't. Um, anything risk-based, enterprise risk especially, and uh, contract management CM. So that those are, that there may well be others, and it will be on an individual uh, uh, basis with, with each customer, but those are some examples of really obvious ones that, that spring to mind around retained capability. I will stress the racy matrix again, really. Just make sure it's absolutely clear what are the retained capabilities. 
You don't want to be halfway through your roadmap when suddenly um, everyone was assuming, I thought you were doing that bit, and the other party is saying, no, I thought you were doing that bit. So let's get it all out in the open um, and, and clear up front. So that's customer. So the next stage is the service integrator. So this is where end-to-end -end service governance, service management is, is happening. Um, key functions around the delivery of the services, the management, the, the coordination, the, the stitching it all together with all of those service providers, making sure all of those cross-functional teams, those landscapes, the, the ecosystem is, is the terminology, making sure that they're all working together collectively, cross-functionally and um, collaboratively, absolutely making sure that the, the, the service, that end-to-end -end piece is working. Okay, and then there's the service providers. So I've already mentioned from a service provider perspective, there's internal service providers, there are external service providers. So um, as an example, in, in my experience, there, there's been end user compute, there's been cloud, there's been desktop services, there's been um, application services, development services, maintenance, all of those can be a combination of in-house, out-house, combination, combination of the two. So the service providers, they're responsible for managing their part of the jigsaw, if you like, and Siam starts to bring it together. It starts to knit it together in terms of, oh, hang on, there's other dependencies there, there's infrastructure components, there's networking components, there's application components, there's database components, there's equipment and so on and so forth. So it starts to look at things a lot more holistically um, and, and the ecosystem um, uh, is, is looked at collectively. But a service provider typically is, has obviously has an interest in their own products and their own services, but the model encourages this collaborative approach, this collaborative way of working. Um, and again, the, the service integrator doesn't have the contractual relationship with the service provider. The role of the service integrator is to provide that end-to-end -end integration. Okay, so there are now four iteratively, iterative sta steps and stages that I'm going to talk through. And you can see them on the right-hand side of this slide, which is discovery and strategy, plan and build, implement and run and improve. So those are the those are the four stages in SIAM and, and that's collectively called the, the roadmap. And this provides a framework, provides a structure, it guides the implementation, it, it starts to, to address things like change management. Now there's change management from a um, uh, from a, a technical change advisory board perspective and a, you know a governing board um, but there's also organizational change there's the people and and that is absolutely an area that mustn't be underestimated as to the complexity the time the involvement the effort um, that, that that part will um, uh, will take and I do come on to that in one, one of the other on one of the other slides but it, it makes it starts to build this the structure for making things more efficient and more effective it's not always linear in experience to, um, that there's certainly various parts of this um, stage that may occur in parallel but um, certainly the in terms of four stages of, of planning, it makes sense to follow that discovery and strategy, the plan and build, the implementation and running and improve. And then each each stage of, 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 the, of the roadmap has various inputs to it and various outputs. So 
discovery and strategy. So we're, we're on the roadmap journey here. Um, discovery and strategy, it's about defining. It's about understanding objectives. So I mentioned earlier about what, what are they, what are the business objective? What's the business trying to do? Is there a reason it's looking at a Cyan model? Is, is there something not necessarily technical, perhaps it is, but you know, from a business strategic perspective, what are the objectives here? Uh, it's about mapping, so looking at business processes, understanding um, what the value proposition is, and um, due diligence is, is a really key part of this and capability analysis. So really not just scratching the surface, but scratching the surface and then starting to take a bit of a deep dive in, into this as to um, the, the, what's the strategy? We've already mentioned, what is the business strategy here? But really, what is it trying to do? Um, what's it trying to achieve? What are the benefits that, it, that it's looking at uh, to, to achieve here? What are the challenges? What, what, how are things operating at the moment? Um, as you as you start to perform a due diligence exercise, you, you'll certainly start to form an opinion as to, gosh, this is quite a, a complex environment, or there's clearly scalability issues here, capacity issues, whatever it may, may be. Um, and each business will have its own different set of challenges. I've mentioned about racy matrix i'm a huge fan of racy matrices in terms of who is doing what so let's just be clear this particular activity have we mapped this out do we really understand who is doing what and where are they doing it and how are they doing it and is it is it doing a good job is it not doing a good job it's starting to build a picture starting to define and map and understand how things work so that the as is situation how how is it operating at the moment but also outward looking as well so looking at what's available out in the marketplace perhaps um, there are other service providers that uh, uh, that may be able to add um, value here perhaps in the current landscape there are service providers that aren't performing or not really doing a good job or too expensive or the quality is poor. So you, you start to build a, a really strong picture. Risks and costs, and another part of this stage is really capturing what are those risks? What's, what's the appetite for risk? And we'll come on to um, approaches um, in, in one of the slides la later on, um, you know, do, do you want to do a big bang approach, for example, or do you want to do it in a phased approach? There are pros and cons of each and there are reasons. Sometimes somebody will do a big bang approach and accept the fact, yes, this might be quite disruptive, but because of X, Y, Z, we want to do this because of time constraints. Um, and, and yeah, really understanding the marketplace, exploring the marketplace, reviewing what is, what is available. The final uh, uh, sort of few points really relate to the fact that this has to be set, that your stall has to be set out on this as this is a project. This is absolutely not do, do it in, in the background you know this has to be a project this is something that um uh, will take time it will take effort it will take resource it will take some money there's lots of um activities going on from a keeping the keeping the lights on perspective this is a project it, it can't be just pegged as this thing that's ticking over in the background it needs to have senior stakeholder engagement it needs to have a sponsor it needs to have people that are that are, are, are driving this in order for it to, to, to happen. So the point is, by having this as a project, you, you, you're able to then establish high level governance frameworks, you, you, uh, you're able to establish exactly what the as is situation is, what is the state of the nation, how is it working at, at the moment, and not only just accepting what people are saying to you, really analysing it and understanding. So 
IT, for example, may well say, yeah, everything's fine, everything's great. If you then go out into the business and you speak to some of those users, they may have a different perspective. They may um, be able to add a, a different uh, a point of view. So really start to gain that um, uh, uh, information through the, the discovery, through the due diligence, and then understanding strategy and, and what is the business ultimately try, trying to do. And then all of this information will allow you to start on a business case and an outline case. So that's the first stage, discovery and strategy. The next stage, plan and build. So this is where the detailed SIAM model, model starts to come in, into play, but also which model is best in this case. Each organization will have different types of challenges, different types of um, uh, requirements, and perhaps the model might be better suited to an internal environment. Um, perhaps uh, the, the model might be an external uh, approach or a hybrid approach or a or a lead supplier so all, all of these items are, are uh, starting to 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 get momentum in terms of what is the plan how are we going to do it what's the best model for this particular type of situation and this particular organization clearly customer requirements are are, are different so consider organizational change management this is a this is a biggie so in, in terms of how to manage people this will involve organizational change this this can be disruptive so it, it's important uh, to, to get people on board to get people on the journey as, as they say and, and and make sure that people um, are helping and are working with you rather than than against you. So the organisational change management approaches. There's an ad car approach that breaks um, various stages down in terms of awareness, desire, uh, uh, knowledge, abilities, and and reinforcement of, of messages. So that there are models available, and and ad car is is something that. Uh, um, I, is a very good way of making sure that that organizational change piece has, has had the right energy, the right effort, the right resources aligned to it. Plan and build phase involves appointing service providers, starting to plan for the transition, um, plan for retirement of, of some service providers. Perhaps some of those service providers are good and, and are there and are up for the journey. Other providers may say, no, we don't want to do that. And uh, there's conversations to be had, there's work, there's effort in, involved in there in, in terms of planning that and, and building that. And, and perhaps um, uh, you know, some of those those service providers need, need to be retired. It's also worth being aware that during the discovery and strategy phase, I've typically found that a number of um, service providers, there's overlap. So service provider A provides a particular service and service provider B um, may well provide a similar service and that they're sort of, you know, there's questions to be asked as to, well, hang on a minute, that you've got two suppliers doing the same thing or they've got the capability to do the same thing. Perhaps there's a way of simplifying things and moving things uh, um, into an economies of, of scale there and, and making things a, li a little easier. But um, lots of work, lots of effort around transition and service providers and, and um, building that ecosystem. I will say, and again, I, I say this from experience, look out for something called shadow IT. What that means is that outside of IT, there may be individuals, there may be departments that are working directly with other service providers. Now, hopefully your discovery and strategy stages has, has come across this and teased this out, but it's entirely possible, and it's called shadow IT, where um, a department or an individual is working with another service provider directly. Maybe they're even having 
um, monthly service reviews or quarterly reviews or whatever it may be but it's important just to to make sure that you're including everything in the governance model because shadow IT is is certainly something to uh, um, to be aware of and, and just watch out for that you want to you're trying to build an ecosystem you want everything inside it um, and uh, and shadow IT is uh, is certainly something that can work against you so um, a good discovery and strategy phase will will tease this information out okay so having gone through the discovery and strategy phase and the planning and, and building phase we, we now get to the implementation phase so one of the questions uh, I mentioned this earlier what's the approach now that will be led by what what is the business what is the customer actually trying to do why is it here why are we having a cyan conversation is there a complexity issue is there a quality issue is there a business driver issue is the company getting taken over um, is something else radical happening so that will that will help select an approach but broadly speaking you've got two ways of doing this you can do the big bang approach or you can do a phased approach an iterative approach each one has pros and cons but clearly you have to be led by what is the customer's driver for being here why, why are we at the Siam conversation what's the business trying to achieve so a big bang approach for example there um, uh, that there may be an acceptance to say okay well we know there's going to be some potential disruption here we um, we've gone through a risk management process and um, we've decided okay well we can mitigate some of this risk we have to go through the big bang approach because we need it done quickly Maybe there's a large um, reorganisation, perhaps the organisation has been take out, taken over, perhaps the contract ends, who knows. But the, these are the kind of information, this is the kind of information you will have teased out during your discovery stage and your, your strategic stage. But um, big bang approach can happen quickly, can be massively disruptive. But again, each customer you, you need to take on, on its own merit. And then the phased approach, again, pros and cons. It may take a longer time to, to complete a phased approach. Um, it may be less risky. It may be easier. There may be a resource constraint that says, well, we can't do everything in one go. We'll have to do it in a phased approach. Pros and cons. Typically, from my experience, in the phased approach, um, it's less disruptive. But um, once you're into the next stage, which is the run and improve, it's entirely possible you've got some of those service providers that are not in the ecosystem at that stage. There's a plan for them to be brought into it, but you're then effectively managing um, both types of models, a SIAM model and a non siam model. This phase involves transition. Uh, we've mentioned around the organisational change management approaches and the ADCAR um, uh, approach this is where it starts to happen this is where all of that awareness that desire that knowledge ability reinforcement activities occur it's a big activity it's a real big activity and you need to get everybody on board there may be some objections people get people um, uh, uh, may not necessarily want to go ahead with this activity for, for example which is why it's important to have senior stakeholders business strategy designed and discovered and and worked through as to this, this is not just an it idea that we're going to do it this way this is from uh, from the top and then um this this stage involves introducing service providers there may be new ones there may be existing ones there may be a case of, uh, of retiring some of, some of those and all of the associated work in, involved there. Make sure all of the risks have been identified. So make sure you have a risk register. Make sure that all of the risks have been captured. Making sure that um, there's a plan in place to mitigate the, these, the, these um, potential risks. These things should, 
should and will have happened earlier on, but it's just a, a point at which just make sure as you go into that implementation phase, are we sure we've got all of the risks? Is there anything else that um, might happen? How would we resolve that? How can we, how can we deal with that? And then finally, the uh, TUPE regulations, so transfer of undertakings. So it's really kind of a people point in, in terms of uh, there may be some individuals that perhaps will, will suddenly change um, who they're working for. So maybe they're suddenly working for a service provider that um, previously they were part of the customer organisation. It's a big area. I can't go into it on, on, on this session, but um, really just a checkpoint. Think about that transfer of undertakings and the regulations associated with that. OK, and then finally we get to run and improve. So this is about operating the ecosystem, keeping the lights on. It's the day to day operation. It's the day to day integration. There's always fine tuning. There's always service improvements that, that can be um, uh, put into place. Absolutely, it's about making sure there's a collaborative approach with service providers. It's easy to say, much harder to do, but it's really important the service integrator demonstrates fair um, and impartial in, impartiality. So um, that environment um, must be a collaborative and uh, collaboration um, uh, um, ecosystem. Structural elements happen here, so working groups, governance boards, change advisory boards, reporting on performance. Make sure you're, you're um, demonstrating value, so that end-to-end -end piece again. Um, look at that ecosystem, look at all the service providers, work on how is service provider A and service provider B and service provider C, how are they all working together how, how is that collaborate, collaborative um, work being, being demonstrated? And then business outcomes. Are there any KPIs, so key performance indicators? Are there any metrics that need to be monitored in order to demonstrate the value that SIAM, that SIAM has delivered? So um, certainly in, in most organisations, um, as you uh, hopefully as you've gone through discovery and strategy phase you you'll start to to see some of the what are the main items that we need to keep an eye on is it um, some kind of volume is it some kind of uh, cash is it um, I, I don't know performance what, whatever those metrics are make sure those are captured those those key performance indicators because those will be key in demonstrating value. Um, just, just a slight aside on, on that, and it's small font, so apologies. But the, um, the complexity point can, can have, have quite an impact here. So for example, earlier on, we talked about what's the approach, is it a big bang or is it a phased approach? So if it's a phased approach, and I, I talk from experience here, if it's a phased approach, um, it's absolutely possible. You can be in the run and improve phase, but there are still service providers that are outside of that model. So they need to be brought into that model as quickly as possible. Make sure there's common tooling, making sure common processes, making sure it's a, it really is collaboration. So just really a, a, slight, uh, a slight point there. Okay, um, so we've pretty much come to the end of the, uh, um, of the deck on service integration. Um, I've, I've put in there a key point. There's, there's two words that hopefully you will have noticed during this session that keep coming up when we talk about SIAM, service integration and management. And that's the, the, the importance of a service integrator being impartial um, and fostering a collaborative approach.
So that collaboration, there's, there's, there's a lot of effort, there's a lot of energy that needs to be put into place in, in order to achieve that. But um, takeaways would be service integrator absolutely has to be impartial. Service integrator absolutely has to foster a collaborative approach with that service integration. Okay, thank you very much for um, uh, for listening to me. Please subscribe and um, thank you very much.